Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to have you here at this scientist warning event focused on energy and around the energy crisis. Um, now, this is the scientist warning presentation on our road to COP27. Um, those of you that were already in just saw the film that we brought out at COP26. And that film was very much um, clear about scientists struggling now to tell us anything more that we should need to know on our path to decarbonisation and to um, setting the world straight in environmental matters. And it also called for leadership. So it introduced leadership as an absolutely key element in what we have to do to get to carbon zero. Um, now, the scientists' warnings, those of you that have followed us previously will know, but I'm going to introduce it for all those who don't. Um, so there was an original scientist warning back in 1992, um, where 1,700 scientists signed, including more than half of the Nobel Prize winners in science, asking us to urgently take action because we were on a collision course with the biosphere. 25 years later on in 2017, there was the World Scientist Warning to Humanity, a second notice. And this warning said that the previous scientists were correct. They told us everything we needed to do. But in fact, as we've done nothing, everything was now even more urgent. And they identified six pillars under which we needed to take action. And that was food, nature, energy, economy, population, and pollutants. That was reinforced in 2019 in the World Scientist Warning of a Climate Emergency. And then at COP26, there was a fourth warning coming out, come out which was the um, World Scientist Warnings into Action. And there an extra pillar was included, which was also in the film, which was leadership. Because the scientists can't shout louder in bolder font if we don't have leaders that are gonna follow that and actually drive forward and create the actions we need. Now we're suddenly today in the middle of an energy crisis, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, potentially in the middle of a food crisis, depending on what's happening. Um, in both cases, in energy and in food, um, it's been affected by the war in Ukraine. So that's very topical in our minds. And um, all of us here must also think about those from Ukraine. And I'm sure our, our thoughts are not only with them, but so are our actions. And our actions will include those who are hosting Ukrainians here, who are supporting measures to, to um, support the Ukrainians um, fighting against uh, Russians and Putin in their own lands, um, and also those who are actually saving energy, because part of this is an energy war. And if we're doing things that can save the use of energy in our own country, actually indirectly we're contributing um, positively. Now, as I move on now to introduce um, our speakers today and our panelists, the, the format will be that our speakers will each do a, a brief introduction, both to themselves, but also um, their own introductory words about energy, about the crisis we're currently facing. Um, and our speakers are led today by Professor Chris Rhodes. Um, Chris is a board member of Scientists Warning Europe, um, an expert um, in energy, and is the director of Freshlands Environmental Actions. Um, supporting Chris today, we have Kayla Abreu, who's the development director of Electric Land, which acquires land for um, the placement of renewables and storage. Um, Abreu is, uh, and um, Kayla is also um, from the Dominican Republic and very aware of what's happening in a number of other countries of the world, um, and may be interested in talking about some of the things happening in that part later on. Um, Kayla Enter, MBE, is the CEO of Brighton & Hove Energy Services Cooperative. Um, uh, an expert and, and an ex-consultant in renewables and clean tech. And Andy Coulton is the founder and CEO of Hope Energy and is ex-KPMG where he was working on tech risk consulting and he has a master's in physics. So that's the introduction and please do put any questions you've got um, directly into the chat and hopefully we'll come to them. We do have some questions lined up already. And please again, just to request everybody now turns off their videos and keeps themselves muted. And we're doing that to um, prevent more carbon emissions coming from this event. Um, okay, um, Professor Chris Rhodes, could I ask you to start, please? You're muted, Chris. Right, I, I'm no longer muted as far as I can see. Yeah, okay, thank you, Ed. Um, yes, a bit about me, you said. Well, um, it's, it's a long story, but I'll just give a few highlights. I left school when I was 16. I became a technician um, in industry, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, had a very good boss who was a sort of frustrated academic. Obviously, he wanted an academic career, but uh, this was in, well, the 1970s, and uh, all the academic jobs had been filled up by the 
by then. So Dave pushed me to go to, went to university. And I did the ONC and HNC part-time. Went to Sussex University, stayed on there, fell in love with uh, chemistry, did a PhD, then decided on an academic career, did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Leicester with Martin Simmons, FRS. And uh, I then became a, a lecturer in organic chemistry at Queen Mary. And then I became professor of physical chemistry at Liverpool John Moores University. I was there for about 10 years. Um, I then got involved with energy and uh, it was discovering about peak oil kind of changed the direction of my life uh, in a, another um, point of order, basically. And then I started up a consultancy um, on energy. I worked for the European Commission. Uh, I've even worked for the Russian government at uh, particular times in the past. And over the last, I guess, 20 years, I've become involved as a consultant and a writer um, and involved as a researcher in all different aspects of, of energy, um, which is both uh, intellectually fascinating, but of course it has so much because it underpins absolutely all aspects of everything. The social implications of energy, uh, uh, whether we have enough of it, what it costs and so on, really determine the, the fate of humanity um, to, to a very large extent. So um, I was particularly involved with oil and the oil price has done some very strange things over the last um, 20 years, um, over the last 10 and the last five. Basically, the oil price peaked um, in about 2008 and then it crashed again and then uh, it increased again. And it was doing quite well at about $60 a barrel. And then along came the pandemic. And then with the lockdowns, planes weren't flying, people weren't going to work, factories weren't running. And the oil industry actually started to shut back a lot of its uh, production because the price of oil crashed to, well, the futures price for West Texas Intermediate went negative by $40 a barrel because there was so much oil being produced, a lot of this uh, due to fracking in the United States, there was more oil than falling demand uh, wanted. There was more oil than anybody knew what to do with. And basically, uh, it was running out of storage space. Then we, we went through the pandemic. The economy we uh, began to recover again, and that oil uh, kind of got up to about $60 a barrel as people were, were moving around and, and doing things once more. And then um, it was well up at about 90 because oil determines, it underpins absolutely everything. You know, oil is almost like the master resource because we rely on it to move everything around, goods and even energy itself. Um, and then, of course, the uh, remarkable, if I may say, events in Ukraine and what happened then because of the, the sanctions, even the threat, the oil price is very sensitive. Gas price is tied to the oil price, generally speaking. But once um, even the, the threat, the possibility um, of an embargo against Russia um, was going to happen, and that would mean some restriction uh, in the oil uh, flowing out of Russia. Um, then it's this supply and demand factor that determines everything. And then the oil price soared in the anticipation that there might be a shortage. And the oil um, supply over de demand um, only has to be, you know, one percent more oil than you need. The price crashes the other way around. Um, demand for oil 1% ab ab above uh, what can be supplied. The price soars. And so here we are in, in this situation where there is a kind of energy. Um, it's not a shortage, but uh, it could become so. And the price is enormous, as we see at the moment. Now, yeah, is, is there a, a cost of living um, crisis? Is there an energy crisis? Well, yes, both, because these things are tied together. As I say, energy um, is dependent upon to do absolutely everything, to move everything around, including food, all goods it's needed um, to uh, uh, supply uh, agricultural machinery um, in the uh, the Ukraine situation because of the blockades. A lot of the uh, the grain uh, Ukraine is one of the the major wheat exporters and uh, uh, maize exporters in the world. And a shortage in supply then starts to knock on to food prices in addition to the to the effects of energy costs. And, and we're we're seeing this. 
What exactly is going to happen is, um, well, I, I, I really couldn't say. The world is in a very strange situation. Um, it's not just climate change. Climate change is certainly a very, very bad situation that we need to address. But as Ed said about the, um, the scientist warning papers, the first one um, illustrated the, uh, the almost 30 years ago, illustrated the fact that human demands are in collision with what can be provided uh, by the capacity of the, the biosphere. In fact, we are a species in ecological overshoot. And so climate change, our carbon emissions driving this, are really all part of this problematic uh, relationship that we have with um, the uh, resources of the planet. And so this is really where we stand at the moment. And this is going to involve um, us changing our relationship with how we use energy and really of all resources. So as we discuss energy at the moment, we are, are really um, looking at our whole relationship with resources and how we can um, basically use less energy and use it more effectively. And the same goes for all resources, because we do need to get ourselves out of overshoot. So um, that's my summary of uh, my, myself, my potted history, and where I see uh, where we stand at the moment. So I'll stop there and let the next person uh, come on. Great, thanks very much, Chris. And, uh, and the word overshoot came in quite a bit in that last the last two or three minutes of what you were saying there. So I guess that's partly what we'll be focusing on today. Um, now, if um, Kayla Abreu would like to go ahead, and so Kayla is the Development Director of Electric Land. Kayla. Hi, hello everyone. Um, so I am the Development Director of Electric Land, which is a property investment company in the UK. And what I specialize on is putting projects together. So finding suitable land, suitable locations to develop in the UK. Um, and from a scalability and development perspective, the main issue we encounter when trying to bring more flexible generation online, and I, when I say flexible generation, I mean across the board. So we get involved on um, renewables and supporting renewables in the sense of battery storage and other flexible uh, generations such as fuel by natural gas. It is um, it's a, the, the biggest issue that we have in the UK, and I will do a little bit of comparison with other countries, is um, the directive from the government or, or the direction that the government wants to say they want to take the country doesn't really trickle down to what the local authorities and the, the local residents where we are very suitable to develop a site. Um, want or are willing to accept. So you have a conflict of interest between where we need to be as a society to be sustainable and to have a flexible enough energy system that meets the need of the population, what the government is saying and what people are willing to accept. And what that really means is we need to come together as a society and set the base of what we deem acceptable within a realistic expectation of we are in an emergency. There is a real crisis. We see the weather is getting uh, to the extremes. It is going to keep getting to the extremes. Uh, the whole premise of um, that is all and well, but I don't want to be looking at a windmill from my house, or I don't want that generation close to my house. It needs to go away. That way of thinking needs to go away. Because if we don't, it's not a, a question of whether it's going to be close to me or do you put it in the neighbor, neighborhood uh, down the road. The question is, it needs to go in every neighborhood. We all need to, to get to the point where we have the centralized energy generation across the country so it can serve everybody. And the mix of what makes a flexible enough, sustainable energy system, well, you know, there is a thousand um, ways that you can get there. I, I've seen that what Sila have put together a very interesting interactive map where you can go around and click in a country and they check um, based on the country's strengths, what would they need to develop to get to net zero in the UK or what they call the British islands, because we are packed together with, with Ireland and um, all the small islands around uh, the UK. Um, 
the, the, the core of the energy generation comes from wind, but you also have battery storage. You also have uh, photovoltaics. You also have hydropower. You also have um, the small uh, natural gas fuel power plant, and you have a little bit of nuclear. You do need a, a very uh, varied uh, mix of generation because each type of generation serves a different purpose. So it's not the sense of we're only going to be based on renewables and we want nothing to do with other types of generation. You need a mix. Each technology can serve a different purpose. And for us, and I, I mean us as, as the UK and us as Europe and each country to be truly self-sufficient when it comes to energy and be uh, <clears throat> reaching net zero, you need to have a mix. You need people to come to terms with the fact we need to have a mix mix and to come to terms with the fact that smaller flexible generation need to go everywhere even if it means it needs to go next to where you live or close enough to where you live um and i i will close my presentation <laughs> saying that what we are lacking here is the population having more knowledge about the true pros and cons of each type of generation and how it may actually affect their home or increase the value of their homes. At the moment, all sorts of you know, energy generation projects are seen as detrimental to the value of their property. And in some cases that might be true, but not in all cases. And there, there are ways to change that. I mean, I personally would rather live next to a solar farm than to a distribution center that has trucks coming in out 24 hours a day, pollution, noise, traffic um, but it's not sensed like that by the by the you know by the population and I think there is an education issue that create barriers for projects to come online and for for more projects to be developed in the UK and in Europe uh, because of the the lack of knowledge and um, understanding of the benefits of bringing more renewables on that uh, thank you, Kayla. And of course, there's so many people that actually would like to have an old fashioned windmill from a couple of hundred years ago on the view in their back garden, but currently wouldn't want a new wind turbine. So presumably by next century, they'll all want the wind turbines we're producing now in their back garden because they'll look nice. Um, anyway, thank you very much for that. And um, now we're moving on to Kayla Enter. So the CEO of Brighton and Hove Energy Services Cooperative. Over to you, Kayla, and welcome. Thank you, Ed. What a fantastic opportunity. Um, I'm going to build on what Kayla said. Um, a lot of it's uh, very interesting because I'll start with my background. I'm a qualified accountant. I qualified in the US, where I'm obviously from. And um, then I moved to the Netherlands. And when I was there, I worked for um, Greenpeace and I was at Greenpeace right after the first Rio summit in, in 1992, um, when Margaret Thatcher notoriously stood up and said, we recognize that climate change is caused by human beings and we need to take action. Um, so that was 30 years ago. And for 30 years now, um, I've been following this journey of trying to figure out where I can do something to, to make a difference. And so I started Brighton and Hove Energy Services Cooperative in 2013, because a lot of the change that has to happen, like what Kayla already said, is local change. It's changes in communities. It's people working together to make uh, to generate their own electricity. And I'm going to go even, and, and to save electricity. So to, to look at how we can improve the fabric of our buildings, because 80% of the buildings in the UK are, have already been built, and many of them are, are leaking heat in the winter. So we, we have to improve the thermal efficiency, uh, uh, a home's ability to retain heat or a property's ability to retain heat for about 20 million homes. That, that's a huge, huge ask. And so 
when we're looking at um, energy cooperatives, of which there are about 1900 energy cooperatives operating across Europe. Um, my cooperative is one of about almost 400 in the UK. Um, we're, we're talking about creating equal access to energy because we also do a lot of work with people who can't afford to pay their energy bills. Um, in Brighton, we have about 12% of the population who can't afford to pay their energy bill. And we all understand that this is gonna get much worse this winter. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we don't have a very cold winter uh, this year because un unfortunately there's quite a few people who die because they, they get um, illnesses that are related to the fact that they just can't stay warm. And the fact is, is that oil has made us very lazy. We, we can burn oil uh, and gas to heat our homes. It, it hasn't been expensive. And we don't care if a lot of it leaks through the windows or the building fabric or through the roof or through the floor. Um, and all this needs to change. This, this mentality that we can accept waste as being a part of our life um, on this planet, that mentality must change. Um, and the purpose of an energy cooperative really is to act as an independent uh, advisor and a source of, of uh, information and someone that people can trust uh, to, to deliver what, what people need. So when the energy crisis started, our phone started ringing off the hook. And, and we have so many people who are genuinely very anxious about their energy bills and whether or not they're going to be able to afford to pay their energy bill. And, and so the quickest thing that we could do and what requires leadership in this area is for politicians to understand that a lot of the solutions to energy are not these big centralized power plants that are going to save, save them um, and their reputations from, from, having, uh, from having the lights go out, as everyone always says. It's, it's really about small local energy generation, so wind. And it's really interesting because we're working on putting up um, some wind turbines in, um, in a national park. And the people in the community, of course, they're concerned about um, seeing that wind turbine from their home. Uh, that's their first concern. But they don't recognize that maybe 100 years ago, they had a wind turbine in their community um, that, that isn't functioning anymore. It's not efficient. Uh, if we did put a wind turbine in their community, it would generate enough electricity to be able to change their heating systems from oil heating, because they're off the gas grid, to heat pumps. First, of course, we have to improve the energy efficiency of their home. That's always the first step. And that's why we need leadership in this country to start a legitimate program of improving the energy efficiency of our homes. It's gonna be a significant investment. I think that there should be at least a third of the cost should be subsidized by government to encourage people to take action to um, improve the energy efficiency of their, their properties. And uh, the, other, the other thing is, is that we don't understand that actually solar panels have to improve the value of your property because a solar panel will last for 25 years. And we know that the price of electricity um, is steadily increasing. And the value of those solar panels is that free electricity that you get from the sun for the next 25 years. What other energy security could a person possibly want? And so what we need to look at is how we put solar on houses in our neighborhoods and we share that electricity between the people who live in those homes 
and the people who don't have homes that are suitable for putting on solar panels to really drive down the cost of electricity uh, for people. It's all about us working together as communities to, to create this change. It's a, it's a shift in the way we think. It's a shift in our value system because the, all the money that we have is not going to help us through this climate crisis. It is not going to create a better world for us. And I, I will end uh, on that note. Uh, what a good note to end on, Kayla. Yes, a bit thought-provoking at the end. Um, just before we move to Andy, we have had just a question um, to somebody about scientists warning Europe. So I think I'll just deal with that as we go along. Um, and why the focus on Europe when the problem of climate is global? Well, yes, the problem of, cl of climate is global. We do have a cousin organization in North America. So scientists warning uh, who are dealing really with North American issues and we're dealing with European issues. And to be honest, we hope lots more scientists warning organizations pop up all over the world um, or even in localities. So if you're interested in helping do that, please let us know. Um, OK, now we're moving on to um, Andy Coulton. So Andy is the founder and CEO of Hope Energy. And, and Andy, after the, the, the end of Kayla's um, talk, which didn't quite finish on the level of hope, maybe you can inject some hope into it. Ah, very good. My goodness, my imposter syndrome is properly kicking in now, having heard everybody else's introductions my goodness so um bear with me while i try and collect my thoughts so good evening good morning for, for those who are not in the uk um pleasure to be here and really 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 delighted briefly a bit of background about myself um and, and hope energy and what we're what we're looking to do and to to achieve um so for myself so i've i've been in the world of work for about 20 years um mostly spent either within energy or within um consulting so as as ed mentioned i used to work for a big four consulting firm in technology uh and then anything to do with with energy that that came to that um going back two or three years ago um it could well have been a midlife crisis um where i had a decision that i took which was basically i wanted to do something else with my life um i wanted to do something that i felt was more valuable um, I wanted to do something which uh, made me feel better about myself as well, if I'm completely honest, because I kind of realized for my career at that point, I'd mainly made rich people richer, bluntly, and, uh, and you know, made myself richer probably at the, at the same time as well. Um, and at the same time, in parallel, I've become very aware of the climate crisis, uh, climate change in general, and what we must try and do to rectify that the, the the issue and the challenge um and so i was kind of put those two things together one of you know trying to do something more valuable with my with my uh life and career and trying to tackle climate change and the one thing i knew how to do was retail energy so i'd work for a, a lot of retail energy suppliers be that directly or actually in my days as a consultant helping other uh, other suppliers so at the end that was end of 2019 going into 2020 so we had myself and, and a few kind of friends uh, had the vision for what then became Hope Energy. The idea being it will be the greenest energy supplier in the UK and then the world. Um, you've, got to, you've got to dream right for these sorts of things. Um, because, and again, not to go into too much detail, but there's, there's a lot of what I'd call greenwashing that happens in the UK energy retail industry. So a lot of suppliers who offer to claim 100% renewable tariffs um, I'd argue, and, and you know, I'm not the only one, that's not quite telling the whole truth. So when you look at where do most organisations buy their wholesale energy, because most suppliers are just merely middle people, they buy wholesale energy, they sell it retail. Where do they buy their wholesale energy from? And it's not um, it's not necessarily 100% renewable sources. Um, so so that was the, the one of the things to tackle. But we also started looking into, can we go even further? Because there are a few suppliers who already do some of that really quite well. Um, and so we started to look into renewable energy itself has its own carbon footprint because you've got to build the infrastructure, you've got to build the wind turbines, the solar farms, the battery storage, whatever it might be. And so we started to look into what does that look like and what can we do to try and tackle that? And then it's kind of like a, a Pandora's box that got opened because then you start looking into actually some of the solutions are just like Kayla just talked about. Some of the solutions are probably more decentralized off grid um solutions where you actually don't need an energy supplier but in the in the interim you probably do need an energy supplier to kind of fill the gaps the peaks and the troughs that you'll have so we started to kind of go along this journey of what else can we do that will be really good 
and and doing all the right sorts of things. So, um, and that's the journey we're still on. Obviously, since we started that journey in late 2019, early 2020, there's been a global pandemic, uh, an energy crisis, uh, war in Europe, um, hyperinflation or whatever, wherever we're heading with that and so on and so on and so on. So it has not been a smooth journey, which is why you will not be able to find us and sign up today and we'll be your energy supplier tomorrow. Because unfortunately it's made my life and our lives here at Hope Energy ridiculously complicated and hard. And the reality being, even if we could actually start and, and join and enter the market today, we probably wouldn't because there's just so much volatility and certainty. So we're yeah we're very much in a we're still gonna we're still gonna do it um, but we need to time it time it right so um, and I'm thrilled to to discuss all of this kind of stuff and all the things the other guys and girls have talked about as well um, but I'll probably shut up there Ed actually and let let them um, let's go through some questions because I think that's probably what everybody else wants to do as well but if anyone wants to reach out to me ask any questions after this find me on LinkedIn um, or our website hopeenergy.co.uk my my email address is on there and love to yeah love to chat to people. Uh, great thanks so much andy and in fact you may just put your linkedin link there if you want people to get in touch with you then they yeah on it straight away so sure thing. Uh, great thanks very much now um just first question it'll be coming to, to chris rhodes initially to kick us off um over the last 18 months scientists warning europe has issued three letters to the prime minister in this country um one addressed um just to him one to the prime minister here and the prime minister in italy at cop 26 and another one about two months ago. And those letters were signed by, um, including Chris himself, um, many of the world's absolute number one names in climate science. So James Hansen and Michael Mann in the States, um, Sir David King, Tim Lenton over here, um, Pierre Verlinga over in Holland. Um, so quite a number of literally the world's cream of climate science. Um, and in that, in each case, we reference 2030 as the only target that is realistically going to keep us safe. Um, now, I'm going to come to Chris first, partly because he signed the letters, so I think that's only appropriate. Um, firstly, to, to make a comment about whether the target should be 2050 or 2030 and why. And then we are in the energy event. So then to come on to and say, right, what's the difference? What are we gonna have to do differently to decarbonize our energy system if we're going to go to 2030 in comparison to 2050. So over to you, Kiss, Chris, Chris, and then I'll come to the others directly afterwards. Yeah, um, however you look at it, we have to do a lot by 2030 um, to get onto the right trajectory for uh, net zero by 2050. And generally what's talked about is we need um, you know, for the out to 2050, at least we've got to decarbonize by cut, cut our emissions by 45% by 2030. Okay, now that is no mean feat. So, you know, people obviously are concerned with the renewable energy. Now, there's been huge amounts of renewable energy, um, oh, growth by 20% in solar energy in the last year, 16% wind energy, etc but it still only accounts for about 0.5% of the total energy used on Earth. So in other words, if you were gonna do it that way, you would need to expand even that amount by a factor of 10 and then roll that out, because we've only got seven years to 2030, roll that out every year um, until then. And that would just about take you there. But I mean, th this is absolutely um, astonishing and I, I don't know if it can be done. If um, you know, the Environment Agency are talking about, well, what if we were going to go to net zero by 2030? And what they suggest is that we do what I've just said, which is a, a huge task, but we also plant lots of trees and uh, repair um, wetlands and basically build natural uh, resources to take it down. But I've got to say, that along with whatever new um, bills, renewable energy we put together, um, we've got to start reducing our energy demand. That is a very powerful way or would be of reducing our carbon emissions. So I think these um, processes have to work together if we're really going to make it. Uh, and in fact, there was already a comment in the chat on, on that mm. we should be talking about reduction um, in energy use anyway. Uh, maybe Chris, if I can just ask you to go slightly further and now to be more specific in relation to let's talk electricity production and only the UK. Um, would you have a few comments on what we'd need to do to get there by 2030 if we're going to get our electricity production 
decarbonized by then. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you um, put together um, wind uh, energy is about 21% of our electricity, solar going through the grids about another 4%, um, burning biomass, that's mainly the Drax plant, which is somewhat controversial that's about another 11%. We've got about 17% nuclear, bit of coal, not very much left now, a couple of uh, percent. But the rest, 42 or so percent, whatever that comes out to, is natural gas. So we're highly dependent on the natural gas to, to generate our electricity still. So if we were going to um, decarbonize electricity, then we need to supplant gas by, well, let's say renewables. But if we're going to do that, then we've got to bring out enough storage capacity, say. Because if you look at the Gridwatch website, you see that when the wind energy is low, the gas goes up in compensation. So if you're going to get rid of that potential backup, you've got to have a lot of storage capacity. So really, um, if you're going to expand renewables to decarbonize the electricity uh, system, then you need to bring out a, a lot of storage capacity to, to go along with it. So a number of things need to work together. And then you've got to start electrifying a lot more devices, uh, for example, if you're really going to go down this um, low carbon uh, energy line altogether. Great. And I think I'm going to bring in now Kayla Abreu, because you talked about storage. So Kayla, still same question, um, you know, 2030 or 2050, what's going to keep us safe? How do we decarbonize the electricity system by then? But also with some comments, particularly on storage, as I know your business works on storage. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, we need we need battery storage. We need and we need to be able to store the energy that gets produced um, during the valleys. So, in energy consumption, is not constant. The the way that we um, behave, like humans, you have peaks in the morning when everybody's getting ready to go to work. And then you have peaks around tea time between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m., especially in the winter months, because everybody goes home, they turn everything on. But because in the winter months, it gets darker earlier, you still have businesses functioning, plus people at home using a lot of appliances and you have, you have your peaks. Then it comes nighttime and you have your valleys. So during the valleys, um, the energy that is produced through renewable generations, such as wind or um, solar, if it's not being used, it gets wasted at the moment. What we need is uh, energy storage to be able to preserve that power to be deployed during the peak times. So if we don't have enough wind during a, a peak, let's say between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m., but we have enough energy stored, we can use that energy and that, you know, you can charge the assets, the, the, the energy storage plants with the renewable and they would want to charge with renewables because renewable power is cheap. It's cheaper than, than, you know, gas generated power. Then you can use that power during the peaks and uh, manage the system and have a truly flexible system. And this is talking from a mere um, energy consumption point of view. But energy storage offers a lot of other services to the network. It can help um, balancing the frequency. So renewables are, I'm trying to, to explain it very simply. <laughs> uh, renewable power is not constant because the wind doesn't blow at the same speed. So you have flicker in the way that the energy is produced. Energy battery storage can try to, to make it constant by plugging in little bits and powers within seconds into the network. So it, it, it gives that service, which helps that when you turn the lights on in your house, it doesn't look like a nightclub. You can actually have power coming, flowing, <coughs> sorry, have a, <coughs> a really bad cold. Um, so it is necessary, but there is a confusion in the market or in, in society about lithium ion being the only solution to battery storage. It's not. The energy storage can be done in many forms. There are a lot of technologies out there, both proven and both uh, in development that can store power and release power long-term. So it, it is about having a true mix of technologies and duration in the network to make sure that we can provide power in those peak times 
um, and hey, make Taylor, the system just, flexible. Because Andy's got his, his, you know, his hand up and I want to keep moving around people a bit now. So I'm going to give you one last quick question for literally a 10 second answer, though. So 2030 decarbonisation from the point of electricity, if money was limitless, limitless, could we make it? We could make it. OK, brilliant. Right. Thank you. Moving over to Andy. I could see, Andy, you expect, I expect you wanted to come in on what I was going to ask you anyway. But first, you've got to go 2030 or 2050. You've got to tell us whether we can make it for 2030, and assuming money is limitless. Um, and then, obviously, you want to come in and talk about storage, I suspect. Yeah. 2030, yes, is, is the answer, in my view, if money is limitless. Um, and obviously, there's a big, a big if there. So I, I think it's certainly possible. I, I was just going to um, follow on, really, from what, from what Kayla was saying. Um, because yes, there's there's more than one type of technology. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, talk and speculation around hydrogen at the moment. You know, green hydrogen, where we've got excess wind and excess solar. If we can scale that, then that becomes a fuel you can kind of turn on and off, the equivalent of gas in some ways. Because that's because exactly as the, the the folks have already talked about, we have the challenge when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, um, and uh, gas is the one that we plug. We plug those gaps exactly what everyone has said the, the other point i was just briefly going to make is i think there is as we, we will have to get used to new types of behaviors and i think the other the other kayla was talking a bit about this as well um uh, and chris maywell as, as well whereby we don't all come home at four between four and eight and turn everything on i think we probably need to start getting used to the idea that we don't do that and things like you know charging our evs so people who've got uh, evs they might come home and the first thing they do at four or five o'clock is plug it in i think again we need to get to get used to the idea that that's no longer going to be um the way the way to do things and that's quite easy there's technology already out there you can you can set your ev to start charging at uh, you know at night times and i think that's when suppliers uh, may well have a role to play whereby it's uh, more expensive to have your energy during those peak times and it's much cheaper to have it uh, outside so again um there's, there's the technologies there the, the abilities are there we just need to flip and do it you know as ever in life brilliant andy so kayla enter following on from that and starting off with 2030 or 2050 can we make it to 2030 but following on from what andy was saying and um, because you work with communities and you did talk about leadership as well in your in your introduction so um, and it seems to me that what andy's talking about is not just technical innovation so whether it's in storage or renewable generation but it's social innovation which i suspect is the sort of thing that, that you're dealing with so 2030 2050 can we get there 2030 and then leadership in social innovation do we need it how do we do it and make it to 2030 if we were very committed and very focused we have the technology and we could do it. One of the issues that hasn't been brought up yet is the uh, national grid. So we're talking about local networks and the national networks. They need quite a lot of investment to be able to handle uh, more uh, renewable energy generation, um, to have the battery storage like Kayla was talking about with this reactive power issue. Um, so I, I would love to see, I, I think that the money is spent badly and we need to look at efficient spending of money, holding um, politicians and governments accountable for how they spend our money um, and, and looking at ways that we could uh, transition affordably because uh, a, a great example is the Severn Tidal Barrage. That that was something that would have delivered long-term affordable electricity. And the other important thing is the EV charging infrastructure. We have to be able to invest in that because I have an electric van and I suffer like everybody else with range anxiety that I'll be stuck somewhere in the middle of the night and won't be able to charge. Because a lot of times when you get somewhere, they're either broken or, so that need, they need to up their game a lot more on the electric vehicle charging, maybe subsidize the purchase of electric vehicles, uh, looking at really strong, I don't think that politicians have the strength to do what needs to be done in order for us to make the 2030 target. And that's the bottom line. 
Um, a cause close to my heart, uh, Kayla, and whether po politicians have the, uh, the, the leadership to get us there. Um, and you brought in the efficient spending of money. So um, I'm going to open it up to the other three, actually. I'll be coming straight back to you and ask you another question on this. Um, but let's look at the efficient spending of money by government. In fact, maybe, maybe Kayla Abreu, as you talked about government and the efficiency of government, maybe you're coming on this first. Um, currently, we're facing a, an energy crisis. The government is talking, and as are the other parties, in different ways of subsidising effectively um, our energy bills to get us through it. Now, obviously, that's the right thing to do to make sure that people don't suffer, but actually it doesn't move us anywhere further forward. Um, and obviously, if we had large capital expenditure over the last decade with a massive ramping up of renewables, we wouldn't be in quite the same exposed place we're in now. Um, and looking at the amount of money that needs to be spent in the future, um, shouldn't we now be looking at over a two year period, looking at the billions, I, th I think one of the figures was it's at 27 billion or something that may need to be done to, to cover the subsidies that are gonna come up and actually spend 54 billion, but put 27 billion in into doing what we need to do for next year to insulate all those homes straight away, to whack in the renewables and everything else. And, and let's get Kayla Abreu to, to do a quick, um, you know, one minute on that, come back to Kayla, enter, and then maybe I'll give a more local example to bring it home. Yeah, so I think giving those subsidies is trying to fix a crack wall with a Band-Aid. It, it, it doesn't work is giving people a little bit of money now, but hitting them a lot harder next year. It doesn't fix the problem. What they need to be doing is giving, first of all, they need to pass legislation to make sure that house builders don't get away with minimum insulation. They have to insulate new homes properly, or we're not doing anything for the next 10 years. They need to give people grants to enable them to insulate their homes. It baffles me how inefficient houses are in the UK. Is a small flat, a small flat paying 250 pounds on energy bills per month is outrageous. It's, it, it's, it's not about the cost of living price of going up, it's about, it, it, it's, it's inexplicable the, the rage that is felt when you have to pay that much money on your energy bills. And mentioning other countries as an example, um, Denmark is colder than the UK and the houses are a lot warmer with a lot less use of, of power. They have renewables, but their consumption, pure energy consumption is lower than the UK. Countries like, well, I'm gonna make an example of the Dominican Republic, consumption is less than the UK and they have air conditioning on which is, you would say, it can, it can extrapolate to the heating cost of, of the UK, is the way that the houses are built here are not fit for purpose. And the regulations we have in place right now are not fit for purpose. House builders need to do better. Okay, great, thank you for that. Coming to Kayla Enter now for, again, a short comment, then we're gonna go over to Chris. Um, but actually just to bring in something that Kayla Abreu said there, um, yes, we need to get grants to insulate homes, totally agree. Um, and I'm totally with you on it. There are cases, though, where um, local authorities have gone to people, even in social housing, and said, we're going to put in all the insulation for free, and people have not wanted them to come into their homes because of the disruption and everything else. Now, my assumption on this is that now when we've got bills that are going up to maybe four times what they were before, that people will be keener to get that done. But, but it was actually not in all cases by any means, but it was difficult to give the money away to do the insulation in some of these cases previously. Kayla Enter, I know you deal with some of this community stuff. I don't know if you've experienced that. Maybe you've got some solutions. Yeah, people do not want the disruption. So one of our biggest issues is, you know, we, we want to make your home more energy efficient. Uh, we think that the, the works May, you may even have to stay in a hotel for a week because there's so much dust and we're ripping out your floors and insulating under that or, um, uh, or in your loft or your walls or whatever we're gonna do to get your house up to, to scratch. It is true that people think very short term and they'll think, okay, even though you're offering them a warm home for the rest of their lives or as long as they live there, that one week, uh, disruption is a barrier. Uh, and that's absolutely true. And it's the same uh, a while ago, we went house to house 
uh, the, uh, on behalf of the council and said, we'll put free solar panels on your roof um, for, for um, council owned houses. And the people, some people didn't want it because they didn't want the cabling running down their walls, uh, even though we would box it in. They didn't want that. Um, so it, it, yeah, I think the climate crisis hopefully will make people think less about the aesthetics which disappears over time and more about the fundamental issues concerning our climate and their well-being. Um, Chris, maybe you could come in some, with some comments on this and thinking our big picture. So if we're going to get everybody across the line as fast as we can and overcome some of these barriers that we just talked about, and you've got any silver bullets that we should be considering? Mm. I am totally on the side of energy efficiency. We do have a lot of rotten housing stock. It's true pre-1948. So yeah, we should be insulating all this as a, as a matter of um, course. We should, we should be doing this as fast as we possibly can, street by street, area by area, you know, that, that would be a very sensible way of uh, spending money. Um, you know, the best form of renewable energy is energy you don't uh, use at all. How do you get everybody on board? Uh, if you offer people grants and they don't take them, um, I'm not sure. However, there's the stick and the carrot. I think there is a very large stick at the moment, which is massive energy prices. And if we could insulate homes properly, for example, this would serve very well to help get people out of energy poverty. And this is going to become an increasing um, factor, I think, across uh, society. So I think, unfortunately, um, the stick is there and the government really needs to start putting its money into making uh, housing stock uh, fit for purpose and cutting our energy use. There's a, an organisation, CREDS, the Centre for Research in Energy Demand Strategies. They're a consortium across lots of uh, different universities. They reckon by 2050, we could cut our energy demand in half in the UK. I think we probably need to go faster than that. But, you know, it does illustrate uh, what's possible. And in Insulating homes is certainly um, going to be a good chunk of that. So I think that's where we should be focusing. And just to ask you, Chris, let's look at our sticks and carrots again. Um, it looks like the government is going to start handing cash to people to help defray the cost of their increasing mm. energy bills. Now, in these instances, if we're handing money to people who've refused to have free solar panels put on their roof or they've refused to have insulation put in their home, then effectively, from a national point of view, they're completely wasting all of our money and they're affecting our energy security. Do you think we should be looking at going further with our sticks and carrots, um, upping the amount of money we're going to give to people, but only giving it to them if they're going to allow uh, insulation or solar panels on their homes? <laughs> I think, given the gravity of the situation, that kind of mandate may be necessary. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, Andy, I'm going to change the topic slightly, give you a, an interesting example. So here in Hazelmere, so we're, we're very eco-conscious. We've got a 2030 target for our whole community, and we've got a parish council that's very going home and working on it. Um, about 3,000 homes, and on a back of a cigarette packet calculation, the increased cost in the energy bills for people in Hazelmere in the following 12 months is going to be increased by 10 million pounds. OK, so that's 10 million pounds for our little parish, yeah, just on the back of a cigarette packet. Maybe it's a bit more or less. Now, let's assume that this crisis goes on for two years. So that's 20 million pounds that Hazelmere is going to be chucking down the drain, um, which it wouldn't have had to if it had insulated houses or solar panels. Now, is there a solution that we could bring which goes there's 20 million quid there? Um, what could we do now, bearing in mind planning restrictions, bearing in mind the issues of, of delivering local power to local places, and um, putting in also the, the issues of you're going to have some houses which are shaded, not appropriate for panels, for instance, and the one next door might be. But as, as I understand it, it's not possible to transfer the energy from one to the other, and then you don't get the full benefit if it's going back into the grid from one house and being drawn out by the other. So just, and, and I'm not wanting a 20 minute on it, but you know, if you'd like to pick out some choice points on that, um, what do you think yeah. <clears throat> So that's probably the point I'll, um, I'll start on is that point, that peer to peer that you just talked about. So one house has some energy, the other house doesn't. So there's, um, that may well become possible to do. Um, and there's some trials that are going on at the moment where they're looking to do that. It's the, uh, Part of the challenge is there's a couple of things. Legislation at the moment doesn't really allow that. Um, 
so there's there's a, there's a bill going through Parliament, I believe, uh, the local energy bill, to try and make that e that somewhat easier to be able to do. But that that could well be the case, and especially when we talk about decentralised grids, like again, what um, what Kayla East talked about uh, uh, in the past. That, that will become a thing. So literally, you know, I'll charge my battery during the day. My neighbour across the road who's not south facing, I can sell my, my energy to him. I think that will come but when I'm not sure is the honest answer. Probably, I think in the coming couple of years. Um, so I think that's that's certainly one point. Um, it, if we had cash to burn, um, no pun intended, of course, it, insulation, is, as everyone, I think, has said has got to be has got to be a thing right there, there is there is one other thing which is probably more at a national level and probably not just unique to your to your parish which i think could potentially be done which is this decoupling of um generation prices so in the at the moment wholesale energy prices is set by gas uh, which is the most expensive the most expensive form now i'm not an economist and when you un unravel this it could well create some issues and problems that i have not thought about but it just seems kind of somewhat crazy we have generation at you know 50 pounds 100 pound a megawatt hour but they're getting 500 pounds you know per megawatt hour um to, to to fund that so that's because the way the the, the the market works is you build up the layers of generation so your base loads and your renewables and your nuclear and then the most expensive unit to to meet the demand of the day or of the minute of the second whatever it is that's the price everybody gets there's got to be a way a more sensible way of doing that uh, which again and if money is no object and, you know, complexity is no object, the, the laws of physics certainly allow it. So, you know, why can't we do something around that? Great. I mean, uh, Kayla Enter, so coming to you on this. So, so here we have everybody in Hazem is lined up outside. We've got 20 million quid. We're burning. We've got our lighters out. We're literally burning the money because um, we're going to spend it over the next two years. Is there a way we can get that 20 million quid and plough it into doing something that's going to save us the 20 million quid? Well, everyone, every community, so there are, I think, 280 local authorities who have declared climate emergencies. Uh, don't quote me on that number, but I know it's around 200, and I think it's 280. But anyway, they, they should be writing what's called a local area energy plan, and that plan would help a community become more energy um, self-sufficient. Uh, and Hazelmere could look at their natural resources. Do you have water flowing through the village that could be captured? Do you have areas of land where you could put solar panels? It, what's the wind uh, presentation in your village? You know, these kind of things um, that you could look at and also, of, of course, the battery storage. Um, and so looking at your real natural resources and seeing how you can use this for the benefit of your community. And plus, of course, investing in the energy efficiency of the properties right away, doing a retrofit plan. So that's what we do is we look on a street by street basis. And what's really interesting is that most houses have a similar architecture uh, on a street. And so you can uh, develop what you call archetypes and you can look at how you can work on a collective basis to invest in, in your community. Um, and if you can find a contractor, which is getting more and more difficult to do, uh, you can get that work done. Okay, Kate, I'm not letting you off the hook quite yet on that one. Um, let's, I mean, just, just looking at it. So everybody in their house, this will be the same around the country, has got £6,000 that they're going to spend extra, roughly speaking, six to £7,000 pounds over the next two years. But they haven't spent it yet. So what we're trying to do is to get them to spend it now on insulating their homes and their solar panels so that actually they don't spend it over this coming Absolutely. period, which also will make us more sustainable and reduce decarbonisation in the area and nationally. So how do we get that six or seven thousand pounds, which I haven't even spent yet, and spend it on what needs to be done in my house? How do we make me do it, encourage me to do it, etc.? If I'm not already going to do it anyway, how are we going to get me across the line? How do we channel it? Now, I know, again, that could be a half hour presentation on its own, but two or three points on that, just some thoughts. Uh, uh, you know, everybody is motivated by economics. If you can demonstrate for each homeowner um, how, how the economics are going to benefit them, 
um, and you're honest and straightforward about exactly what work needs to be done it, uh, in order to reach that and, and come up with a uh, plan that people can trust, you've got a better chance. I mean, uh, in every, because we've done this now already with four communities looking at decarbonizing heat for rural communities that are off the gas grid. And time and time again, we see that there are a percentage of people who will never do anything, no matter what you do, they just won't budge. Um, and these are people who are very fearful of change. Um, and so they will, won't be the first ones to move, but maybe after everybody else does it, they'll do it because everybody will be talking about how their lives are improved. Okay, great. Coming to you, Chris. Um, happy if you comment on what I've just said, but I've actually got another question for you anyway. So it's up to you if you comment on the one we're just leaving. Um, wind. So can you give us an idea of sort of what wind generation we could expect in the UK if we were at our maximum? You know, what's happening at the moment? Just a very brief picture of what's happening with the onshore and the offshore. And then let's come on to onshore. How do we unlock our potential for onshore wind? Hmm. I mean... At the moment, as I said, we get 21% of our electricity from wind energy. Um, now, a considerable uh, proportion of that is offshore. Of course, there is the, it's already been mentioned, the, uh, the nimbiest uh, factor of people not necessarily wanting the things. But the government is talking about um, quadrupling our wind energy altogether um, as part of their 10-point plan, uh, their, their green uh, plan. Now, OK, um, I, I, that can certainly technically be done. But on the other hand, as we've already said, you really do need the appropriate uh, storage capacity along with that. And so so that is important. I mean, there, there is plenty. If there was um, you know, limitless money around, OK, you could go a long way. But we do at some point start to run up against the limits of natural resources. As we start to electrify the energy system, even copper becomes an issue, getting a hold of that to um, you know, produce the wires and so forth to distribute the electricity. And um, you, you see, if you look in the back of the BP statistical review, the, the sort of basic resources for um, renewable energy, the price is increasing steadily. So it's not just what we do in this country. We will be in competition with all other nations to try and do the same sort of thing. And so the supply and demand factors that drive the energy prices up, which is where we are at the moment, will also apply to other resources as we try and build the brave new world of um, low carbon energy. So there are a lot of factors there. Yes, and specifically um, then, Chris, looking at um, onshore. So in terms of, have you got some comments on ramping up onshore? And I understand the, uh, the issues on the, the limits on the metals and everything else we need to create it, um, which is another good reason why if the UK was looking at self-interest and energy security, it should go now hugely fast while those resources are there to some extent, get the thing done and then create efficiencies from it. Um, but in addition, onshore is certainly something where um, we should be doing a lot more of, and there appears to be a number of roadblocks on it at the moment. Have you got any ideas on how we can unblock it before I come to Andy? Um, the, the roadblocks I'm aware of um, are disputes over whether that land should be used for um, agriculture or building houses or putting uh, wind turbines. There seems to be a lot of friction over this. I mean, obviously, you have to get appropriate licenses and go through the rigmaroles of the legalities of, of the whole thing. But um, I don't see any fundamental um, barrier, uh, honestly, or why there should be, why the mandate couldn't be changed if, if that is what's getting in the way of it. Um, sure, the money's got to be available. The companies have got to be um, around to do this. Most of our wind turbines, well, we, we don't make them in this country, do we? They come from uh, Denmark, I think, uh, a lot of them. So, um, you know, there, there are all, all these uh, factors. Um, but I don't see any particular um, reason why we couldn't expand uh, as uh, necessary on, on shore wind, unless some, somebody else knows um, a problem that I'm not immediately aware of. Andy, if you'd like to come in yeah. now. And, um, yeah. 
particularly on unlocking onshore. Um, yeah. The word nimbyism, although I hate these sort of, you know, words to summarise something, but this idea of not wanting it in, built in my backyard, which means I object to planning proposals locally and then I can't get it built. Um, would you be like to comment on that and just generally on how we unlock um, wind yeah. onshore? And, and, it, and it is that. So, Chris, to, to my knowledge, it's the same as yours. It's it's purely down to uh, the, the, the nimbyism, as, as Ed puts it, because in Wales, you can there's onshore wind farms. In Scotland, there's a lot of onshore wind farms. In England there's more restrictions, um, but the, those are not technical restrictions. So they certainly can be overcome with, once again, Ed, political will. Um, so that's that's certainly uh, one of the points to, to make there. And I think we absolutely should do it. And, and again, I think somebody put in the chat and someone, um, maybe uh, Kayla A might have the answer to this, just around what what is the, uh, how many people don't want uh, wind farms in their back garden? I've got two young kids and they love the sight of wind farms, you know, driving down down the motorway and they see the wind farms, they're absolutely amazed by it. If we, if we could see a wind turbine from our house, they'd love it. You know, so so I'd love to kind of know, yeah, what, what, what is that? What is that stat? Very briefly, Ed, just a couple of other points. I think um, one of the things Chris mentioned about raw materials, he, he's, he's right, of course. But I think that's another area we could we could improve on recycling and the whole circular mm -hmm. economy. You know, if we can get better at doing that, we waste so much, you know, and, and not unique to the UK. So I think as the, if we can get better in that and back to carrot and stick um, mm -hmm. somehow, some way, if we could do that differently. And the final point I just wanted to briefly mention, um, physics does come into play with, with some of this around where the sites are for generation, because uh, you can only physically, you know, shove so much power down a cable. And so if we did, it did end up having every single wind farm off the shore of Scotland, um, the, the transmission and distribution networks to get that energy all the way down to Cornwall, uh, you, you, lo you lose a lot of it. So th there does come a point where we do need generation locally. Again, mm. this comes back to community energy as well. Kayla's already talked about. Yeah. So again, that all of this is possible to do. Uh, it's just bloody do it, you know. <laughs> I mean, you talk about the the, um, and we talked about storage a bit earlier on. But let's just assume up in Scotland we could have a massive amount offshore. Um, could hydrogen be the solution in using it, all the excess to create hydrogen, then ship the hydrogen down and use the hydrogen to create energy in the south in Cornwall or wherever we were talking about? Um, or is that still hopelessly inefficient because you lose half the energy when you convert it into hydrogen? No, I think I think the answer is is yes, as, because it, where you've got excess, it's a really windy day because at, at the moment in this moment in time, we we turn off some of the wind turbines when it's a super super windy day, which seems insane, but it's just the nature of the beast. So when we have excess renewable energy, then we absolutely should capture that, whether that's into battery storage, like you know Kayla A was talking about, or producing green hydrogen. And you're right, you know you could then shove that down to the to the south and uh, and and use the the, the hydrogen gas as a, as a as a source. So absolutely, uh, the infrastructure. Um, again, I'm not a, an engineer. You may well have to change and build some new infrastructure, but certainly um, it's it's feasible. Absolutely. Yeah. Great, Kayla Abreu. So you've just got another plot of land, okay? It's going to be for wind. There's opposition to it. How do you overcome it? I don't. <clears throat> I don't think you can. So on on wind, um, it's a very specialized system to get planning, at least in England, um, where you need to do, do consultation with the with the local residents for twelve months before you can actually submit the planning application to the council. If the local um, residents are opposing, the chances of you getting planning consent are very low. And it is a massive roadblock to bring wind online because developers just don't have time to sit around for two years, two years and a half in the hope that they're going to be able to, to, to build um, the, the project. So you... The, the reason why we've seen that wind development in the UK have slowed down is, is that. If there is a roadblock on planning, um, I've seen some questions in the chat about um, whether, like, what percentage of opposition we get from, from local residents on projects. I would say about 70% of the projects I've worked on, and I've worked on, give or take, probably about 300 planning applications for energy generation in the UK, about 70% of them get a lot of um, opposition from the local residents. So it's a massive um, waste of time 
for all parties involved to, to have to fight them to be able to help them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Before you go, if I, if I was going to put small wind generation into my garden or on my roof, do I need planning permission for that? You do need planning permission for that. And one of the main issues we have with wind is the clearance around the windmill. So wind is not really feasible for home generation because the, you need a clearance of the height of the windmill all around to make sure that if it falls, it's not going to hit anything. So unless you have a big backyard, uh, which is not common nowadays because the population has really taken on a lot of land, uh, unless you have a big piece of land, it's not really feasible to have um, a windmill in your house. But there are other things that you could do in your house. So uh, pump heat, solar panels, uh, battery storage. If you have some sort of renewable, you can put some, some energy storage in your home. Those are more uh, suitable for home solutions than wind. Okay, last quick one, then we're moving over to Chris. Um, and it's we've seen quite a number of questions in the chat about the mix of energy. Um, I think that's partly because somebody mentioned earlier on about smaller, flexible generation of energy was actually the way to go. So, and literally one minute from you, because you've been on for a bit then, Kayla, and we'll move to Chris. So talk about localization of energy and the mix between large scale and small scale local production. Quick comments on that? Yeah, so I think we need both. So you need to have the big plants to serve the, the grid in the system as a whole, something that can be managed to the big load, but you also need smaller localized that could also function behind, uh, behind the meter, so to say. So B2B um, to, to help consumption and try to help the end consumer with the prices. Great, thank you. Now, Chris, I know you've been looking at localization of energy at different times. So UK focus still for today's discussion. Um, so the mix of energy coming from the big to the localized and how much can localized really give us? Um, well, you have examples. There is um, the, the, the super home in Reading, which uh, I forget the chap's name, he's a professor at the university and he owns this. And this is virtually self-sufficient um, in energy. It, it has solar thermal, has uh, solar photovoltaic. It's extremely well insulated. He built an extra wall on the outside of it. Um, you could really um, cut the energy consumption of buildings, oh, vastly, um, down to 20% probably. Um, you know, this would be possible. Again, it depends on how much money there is available, but you could do that. Um, th this is small scale energy uh, generation. If you wanted to be totally off grid, of course, you've got to have your own uh, battery system. Otherwise, um, the grid goes off well, so, so does your um, solar um, benefit, basically. But we, we could really do a hell of a lot at the local level. I, I'm involved with the Transition Towns movement, for example. We've got quite a lot of um, uh, you know, low um, small scale energy generation um, in, in Reading. Uh, a lot of uh, insulation going on as well. So I, I think we could really, um, yeah, as they say, um, act local, um, think global. But uh, if we get together and move uh, very rapidly, we need to do that, then I think we, we could really um, make it in terms of our energy requirements. And I agree completely about the, um, the benefits of having uh, an energy mix. Yeah, for sure. So Kayla Enter, what would your recommended energy mix be? So big, big, big solar, big wind, plus whatever you do locally, how would you do it? I, I would do um, offshore wind. I would do onshore uh, wind um, and solar. I would do tidal where that's appropriate. Um, I, I would, and I, I think that would be primarily the, the solution. And then just small amounts of gas just in case. Mm -hmm. Uh, interesting target now, uh, interesting question on communication. So I think we'll start with um, Andy on this one. Um, 2050, 2030, useless, meaningless targets for lots of people. 1.5, actually, what does it mean? You know, and so are these things remotely uh, possible? Um, are they going to help us get the right kind of action on individual level or people voting in the right way? 
or have we got to bring it down to much more peace for piecemeal meaningful things for their own lives good question um i honestly i honestly don't know i really don't know sometimes you, you do wonder what do you need to get some of these messages across because the you know the science is there you know the data is there we've got to we've got to try and get to it but how do you get those messages down i think i think for me um we, we need this taught in schools, you know, at a really early age. We need to learn about uh, where does that energy come from and how, how does it all kind of work and how does it all sort of work together, but also an element of, you know, political savviness that comes with that because there is politics at play. I never learned about any of that until I was well out of my education, um, you know, in my yeah. 20s. And so I think it, I think we've, we've got to start teaching our kids about about this kind of stuff I and mean, it might be too late you know for that generation but I do it I do it now I, my five-year-old she knows about climate change and she knows about you know wind turbines and you know renewable energy and all that kind of stuff and smoke is bad um, and all that kind of stuff so anytime she sees someone walking down the street smoking a cigarette she's like oh they're bad <laughs> so um so right. yeah, yeah. Kayla enter communicating it 2050, 2030, irrelevant in terms, we all think it's the earlier target, but meaningless targets for people in the street, 1.5, meaningless target. How do you present it when you're talking to people? Um, for me, it's really um, talking about affordability and um, transitioning communities from, from oil and, and the impact of climate change. I don't talk about dates because uh, our pro a lot of our problem is that central government is looking at the local authorities for being the ones to roll out their programs uh, and they're not supporting community energy at all. Um, and so uh, what we focus on is taking action and helping people locally, hoping that at some point government will figure out that we are doing something and, and will support us. If I can jump in just to give a quick comment on this particular one, I, th I think that the um, by choosing the, the earlier um, target, it is possible to communicate it to people. I think that 2030 rings true. And I think the second part about it is it's occurring when you have an MP will have one term in parliament. So it suddenly becomes very relevant for your elected or, or a councillor, although just slightly two terms now, or a chief executive or a managing director. It's effectively their one term in position. So actually the people taking leadership roles now, we can communicate our requirements to them because that's what, you know, they're coming in now and they can communicate back what their aims are going to be. I think that's easier. Whereas 2050 was always way too far off. And 1.5, um, I would agree with the person asking the question, doesn't really say anything to the man in the street. Um, right, just like to, to come in now on an inevitable, somebody's put in the, the inevitable question on nuclear. So if we're going there, we're, we're saying that 2030 is the target that we need to get to if we're going to keep ourselves safe. Um, Chris, does nuclear have a role to play in this? And if it does, how much of a role? Mm, there are a lot of issues um, over nuclear power. Okay, what, what, why do people want nuclear power? Well, they say that when the uh, the reactor is, is running, it's not producing carbon dioxide, so it's clean from that point of view. However, the nuclear waste is uh, an, an issue that uh, is uh, yet to be resolved. Um, what strikes me is actually how do you fuel it? Imagine we were going to um, expand our nuclear capacity by a factor of five. It would probably take 10 or 15 years to build new nuclear power stations, so that'd be no good. It wouldn't help us um, out to 2030. But you look at, say, the internet. National Energy Agency's uh, roadmap for net zero by 2050, they talk about a doubling of nuclear uh, power. But as I say, if you, just for the sake of argument, if you, you weren't going to go so far down the line of renewables, you were going to use nuclear. Well, one estimate is there's 90 years worth of um, uranium, another 230, divide by five, 18 years and 46. You know, it, it really is a, a very short term gain. Uh, it's not going to take us into the future unless you go down the route of using the majority of uh, uranium. M238 and turn it into plutonium and fast breeder reactors. And that is a very, very iffy issue. And I don't think a lot of people would want to do that. So I think if we could avoid nuclear, I think rather than um, 
expanding nuclear, we probably need to keep the ones we've got going at the moment in the middle of this energy crisis. But rather than expanding further, um, I come back again to uh, reducing our energy use, insulating buildings, relocalization, active uh, transport, reconfiguring um, towns and cities so we can do uh, much more locally, uh, home working, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that's got to be the better way to go than expand the nuclear power because although I see the, the points of view why people like it and see its advantages, I think it's just going to be something that's going to last over a relatively short term and leave a lot of problems, basically. Right. Yes, great. And, and in fact, bringing in nuclear to some extent allows us to continue our levels of consumption and waste as we are mm. at the moment. Whereas when you talk about localization, actually what you're saying is energy use reduction by becoming more efficient because we're delivering it locally, we're delivering our services locally, and we're using less energy for actually doing that. And, also and, it, and it's also the time it takes as well, sorry, to build these things. You know, you can't build it in, in, a, in, a, in a day. You know, they take years yeah. and years to build. So I said 10 to 15 years. To 10 to 15 years so that wouldn't help us out to 2030 yeah yep. mm. Ab absolutely and but just now to, to to bring in um kayla enter i think onto a comment here but moving away uh, from this topic into the waste and resources topic which has been asked a few different times through here actually through the through the chat so talking about and, and you actually mentioned kayla in your opening statements about the no waste mentality now let's bring that into the energy um, cycle and there's two parts of this. So no waste of the actual energy resource itself, but then there's no waste of all these rare earth metals and all the other things we're gonna have to use to build them and how we recycle them afterwards. So maybe you'd like to comment about that a little bit. Can I just quickly say about nuclear, the, the irony of the whole nuclear thing is you need so much cement to build a nuclear power plant that we're actually front loading the carbon emissions when we do nuclear. Um, and if anything, we should understand when Russia invaded Ukraine and they went immediately to the nuclear power plants. And right now we are really at risk of nuclear threat. That should be enough of an answer for anyone who is supporting nuclear. Um, so, and with regards to elements, um, this is a really good point. Uh, in the UK, we have cobalt in, um, in um, Cornwall, and, and we could actually start mining that cobalt and create our own lithium ion batteries here. Um, we've got a chance to create a new industry. Um, and I've been an environmentalist my, my whole life. Um, and for me, it's very, very difficult to make decisions about the um the cycle uh recycling you reusing materials um what what the footprint is I, I think that we just have to approach it that w where is the worst evil that we need to mitigate immediately um and how are we going to develop the materials in order to um ensure that we're minimizing waste over the long term um, it is the only way. And how are we going to recycle? You know, solar panels last for 25 years. W what's the recycling um, process gonna, gonna look like for that? So it's always about looking at the entire chain and, and how you, what's the end of life process for these materials? Um, great. And somebody had been mentioning as well in the chat about finance, sort of talking about the fact that actually finance in some senses isn't really the issue for government. It's about, it's about getting them to focus on the right thing and then the finance can be created. And, and as we are talking, when you're talking about capital investment as opposed to subsidies, your capital investment, of course, pays back in the future anyway. So it's, it's a very, very different thing to racking up government debt purely on subsidies. Um, so coming to Kelia Abreu, you know, in the investment in land industry, um, you know, you're investing in the land, others are then investing in, in the uh, renewables that are going onto the land. Um, are the financing elements of that that could be cracked, made easier, would accelerate it and just make the whole thing roll out much quicker? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> the, there is a lot of trust at the moment in energy projects. They, people that are looking for investment to build um, are struggling to find the projects to put the capital into. 
So we don't really have an issue when it comes to investing in the industry, but we do have an issue on being able to get the projects online quick enough. So we, we have an issue with the way that the grid was designed, not just in the UK, but in many countries. It was designed as a centralized system, and now we're trying to distribute it. So the infrastructure, taking a back a step, is not really there to enable all of these projects to come online quick enough, which will present a problem. But when it comes from, from the finance perspective, the money is there. People are willing to put the money down to get these projects over the line. Um, and that perhaps is one of the main reasons why having decentralized, localized, local energy generation that goes directly to the end consumer is a major part on how we can actually reach net zero. Another thing, I, I, you guys mentioned hydrogen at some point, don't remember who it was, but one of the also main points of hydrogen is it can open up communities that are too far away from the grid or that the grid is so constrained that they whatever they generate from renewables cannot be put into the network because the network cannot accept it at that location. But hydrogen is a solution to that. You could use the renewables to create hydrogen to, for fuel, for for um, industry uses, for housing. So there are solutions and the money is there. We just need to be, well, actually it goes back to the leadership. The government, not just in the UK, needs to be do better at giving directions on how we are going to get from point A to point B. Thank you very much. Andy, I'm going to bring you in here. You clearly on a on a sort of company basis, finance has been a big issue for you over the last few years, and that's what you'd have been working on. But taking taking the experience of that, pu pushing it up into the, you know, the sort of national target or international target, but please distinguish in whichever one you may comment on, partly because I've noticed in the chat we haven't always been saying if we're talking about 2030 for the UK or globally. So let's 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 specify as we go. But looking, say, at national targets and things, um, unlocking the finance to get everything done. How are we going to do it? How are we going to do it indeed? I, I mean, as Kayla said, and she's probably, oh, she's definitely closer to, to this than I. The, the finance, the funding is there. I think that's that's never really been too much of, of, a, of a challenge. I think sometimes the challenge uh, that I found is it's there for large, for large, or for large corporates you know it's 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 much easier for them to access the finance than it is say you know a, a startup like like myself and and hope energy um and i think that's where some of the challenge lies and you've got with that uh, and some of this may end up getting into a uh, a philosophical debate about you know capitalism versus not versus socialism or something like that but um but i think it, the, the finance is there is it always going to the right places and as as Kayla said, are we always be able to unlock it and do whatever it is we need to do in a quick enough time frame? Um, th those are the, definitely the challenges that need to be uh, addressed. How do you do it? Uh, it comes back once again, leadership and, and, and politics. Um, so uh, until we can kind of square that circle, we're in an echo chamber here. We all agree pretty much on, on what needs to be done. But until we can solve that side of it, um, it's it's going to be a real challenge. And I know earlier I said 2030, we can absolutely do it, um, but we won't do it unless something drastically changes, certainly in the UK. Um, globally, again, is a much bigger question, I think. But certainly for the UK, that's that would be my uh, my two cents, Ed. And going to keep you there, and then I'm going to ask the others if they might put their hand up if they want to come straight away on this one. Skills. We don't even have the skills to do it all anyway. So if money was limitless tomorrow and we all had you know pots of cash in front of us and we could just get on with it, um, would we have the skills in the UK to roll it all out? When I'm thinking about uh, skills, that's that's in all areas: insulation, you know, local yeah. renewables, large renewables, storage. Do we have the skills? And if we don't have the skills, if money again was limitless, so we had pots of cash, how do we unlock all those skills over the next six to twelve months? I'm no expert in this. My assumption would be we don't have the skills on mass. Um, again, though, you, the, there'll be with the, the right initiatives and the right um, leadership, we, of course, we, of course, we could get there. So, um, and, and I think there is a lot of folks in the younger generation. So I've got nieces and nephews, you know, half my age, really interested in getting involved somehow, some way, in tackling this challenge. And so I think there are certainly that generation coming, as well as you know, I'm sure my generation as well. But I think in that younger generation, there's there's a lot of uh, people really want to do something they don't necessarily know what to do i think if there was a massive and i'm spitballing now a massive government scheme on 
you know, we want X million people to be installers of this insulation, to build wind turbines, to, you know, build st whatever the case may be. I really think that could be, that could be really quite powerful. Um, great. Will, and Will said, yeah, a wartime effort. Yes, Will, I agree with you in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I've seen that coming through a lot on the wartime effort. I was going to comment on it, actually, but I thought I'd just comment on, on obviously your nieces and nephews. I mean, they, they can't be out of primary school if they're only half your age. So I'm not sure. What to do. <laughs> you smoothie, you are smoothie. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I did actually bring in a, a bit of an example on the skills one, something I heard at a local government association uh, meeting in Harrogate. And, and it's from Sussex. So, and it was, uh, it was somebody presenting on behalf of one of the district councils. And I will now immediately make an apology to the gentleman if I get it completely wrong, but I'll give you the idea of what they were doing. So the district councils in Sussex had all come together. And what they've done is they've looked at the amount of money they spend on repairing all of their social housing or council controlled housing over the course of the next eight years. Um, they totted it up into the millions it was going to be. And then they went and said, that we're only going to do all of our repairs in a green way. So we're going to be retrofitting all our buildings, putting in renewables and everything else. And we're going to do that for eight years amongst all of us. And that budget coming out to, I don't know, maybe a hundred million or something like that over the course of the eight years has driven the creation of skills. So all of those businesses locally now know there is a market for those skills. They mm. know they're going to have it. They know there's contracts out there. And what now they've found in Sussex is that bit of leadership has actually now driven the private sector into it because the private sector now knows the local skills are available or they're going to be available in a couple of years time. So now private sector can come into it and, and start driving it. Um, mm. Okay, the wartime effort, uh, did see that comment come through quite a bit. So I'm going to Kayla enter. Wartime effort to get the skills we need? Absolutely. And this is a top priority um, in, in Brighton. We, we do energy surveys. Um, and after the energy survey, we call the customer and we say, OK, what's the next step? We think you should do this, this and this. And they say, great. Can you project manage this for us? And we started doing it. But then we had to stop because we found no suppliers to do the work. Um, when I first started Vesco 10 years ago, there were probably 20 insulation installers in the area of Brighton and Hove. Now we have none. And I just heard today, the only one we have uh, that was in the area is not doing Brighton and Hove anymore because they're absolutely overwhelmed with work. I also heard last week, two major contractors that we wanted to work with for taking on the street by street project are both going out of business. One's already gone and one is going. So the situation is dire and it started when uh, the government um, did the green deal and made suppliers pay to be on their procurement lists. And then those suppliers never made any money. Uh, they lost money. A lot of them went out of business. And it's just been going downhill since then. And I'll also say that the government changed the code for sustainable homes was a really great strategy for improving uh, the thermal efficiency of, of homes in the building stock over a period of time. That was also completely abandoned. Um, so it's been legislation that has worked against us consistently, I would say over at least the past 10 years. So we sort of, in a way, we're coming back to the same issue, aren't we? It comes back to finance, government leadership, dedicating the right amount of finance over the right period of time then skills will be developed, then security is provided for businesses that can then move towards that in the future. So, so as an example, if we had government dedicate 2 billion to insulating our homes this year, um, but then we had a fund that was ongoing because all of the, the people who've had their homes insulated, the money they're saving on their electricity and gas bills, they would then be putting, um, you know, paying over a period of time gradually to pay the money back, but that money could then be rolling on in the fund that rolls it around the country, continuing yeah. to insulate street by street. Yeah. What about Kayla on this? You, you mentioned street by street insulation uh, and um, or, or was it renewables? I didn't quite get it. Is that oh. really possible? Can we get whole streets to agree to go and have everything insulated and renewables put out? Or is that always going to be ad hoc because half of them are not going to agree? We're doing it right now. And I can tell you that half of the people on the street are engaging with us and half are not. And I suspect that the half that are not are private in the private rental sector. They're landlords who are don't they don't have any there's there's no motivation for them uh, to to get the work done. 
Um, and so in that regard, uh, our ability to, to make a difference is severely hampered. And I, I would also say that it's great that local authorities are um, doing a commitment to their own social housing, but in Brighton, that's only about 10, that's only about 15% of our entire built environment. So it's a very small share of what actually needs to happen. 45% of the, uh, the housing in the Brighton area, Brighton and Hove, is in the private rental sector. Right. Um, can we completely change the topic now, Chris? Nationalisation of our um, energy industry or not? It's come up in the chat. What's your What's your view, view on that? Um, a lot of people are nervous. Uh, I'm one of them. Of our energy, uh, our water, and essential um, requirements being owned by uh, foreign agencies. And yeah, I, I think we should, I hesitate to use the word, the phrase take back control because it has other implications with Brexit and so forth. But um, I think in, in this uh, instance, yes, it does make sense to have control of things that are so essential um, to, to running British society. To some extent they take back control can be carrots and sticks, focus, mm. targets, um, penalties if you don't do it, incentives if you do do it, which doesn't necessarily require nationalisation. Throwing it over to Kayla Abreu, nationalisation or not? No. Based on how the government runs everything else, I would say no. So you're basing it on them being not very good at running the other things, so you wouldn't want them running the national... I don't think they're ready for this. <laughs> right. Okay, Andy. I think I think uh, there's an there's elements of the energy system which potentially could be. Um, a take in, uh, Kayla makes a good point. They'd obviously have to be run by the right sort of people, but where where there's no where there's no competition really, so um, the uh, distribution and transmission networks for instance you know there's, there's which are all the pylons and all the substations and everything else um those are privately run you know for profit uh, you and i have no control over that as end consumers we, we can't choose who we get that that from so i think there's there's an argument there's a strong argument i think for some some of those elements to be to be nationalized i think maybe for the end supplier i'm i'm maybe biased um i, I think i could i could i think there's certainly an argument for it to be uh, um nationalized but I think privatization or, or having private companies does allow some competition, which needs to be well regulated. And again, there's a, there's a government point in, in that. And, and again, without getting down a, another rabbit hole around off gem and, and regulation. So I think um, I think parts of it could, um, but I think some parts it might still make sense to, to not be. OK, great. Um, prefacing the next question, I quite like a hand up who wants to answer this one first, if you would like to do that. If not, I'll volunteer somebody. Uh, but one of the, the gentlemen on here, and I can't remember whose name it was, was talking about <laughs> in Northern Ireland, about 75% of people are going to be in technical fuel poverty by the end of the year. So spending more than 10% of their earnings on, on fuel and energy. Um, so sort of bearing um, that in mind, um, and then thinking about the fact that currently we have the issue that our electricity prices through an international agreement are pegged to our gas to gas prices. But we have a lot of renewables that actually are generate, you know, generating electricity much cheaper than those that are using fossil fuels at the moment. Now, any of you much cleverer than me in the system on how this works, able to explain um, a the link between the two, and then how could we get out of it and put it right? Okay, go ahead, Andy. So the the, the link part I, c I can sort of explain, and it's and it's because. Uh, as, as we mentioned earlier on a previous question, the, the, the way the system works, the way the balancing system works on the electricity side is you build up the different generation types up until the very last point, um, which is typically it's gas and usually the most expensive form of, of gas and generation. And then everybody gets that same price. So if there was a way of decoupling the two, then in theory, and again, back to physics and possibilities possible, in theory, then you could have a mix, which is... Um, a much more sensible cost. Yes, you may still have to pay the gas at the whacking price, but in theory, you could you could chunk up the other bits. Um, for the other bits, I'm not so sure. Now Kayla's got her hand up, so she might be able to to cover that. Do you want me to? All right. Can I? I just want to go back to the nationalisation of the energy industry because uh, 
one of the issues that was not mentioned that is super important is the fact that the taxpayer could not afford to pay the price to buy back these companies. I don't think that it would de deliver value for money for the taxpayer to, to buy back at the, at the market price uh, of these companies now um, in the industry. And that would create a big problem. And I agree with Andy in the fact that Maybe DNOs, and and I've always supported this because we need, like I said earlier, we need huge investment in our our in our local um, distribution networks. The DNOs are not going to; they're going to invest in accordance with what their shareholders will accept. Um, and so, breaking up part of the those networks and to allow for investment, preferably community investment. Um, could could be a really great way of attracting more capital and getting the investment in the networks that we need. Um, in terms of uh, decoupling uh, the the the, pro the energy prices from from gas, um, it, it's it's complicated because you've got trading arrangements, you've got trading contracts that um, companies have entered into. A lot of the reason why energy suppliers went out of business is because the, the prices that they had contractually arranged were not being upheld by, um, by the, um, the supplier that they were buying that energy from. Um, so they reneged on those prices, they reneged on the contracts, and then the energy suppliers went out of business. But it's also the result of government policy of saying that um, you can just switch supplier and that's going to help you manage your energy prices instead of focusing on generation and ensuring that we had affordable generation um, in the country and not regulating to ensure that energy suppliers we're generating a sufficient amount of affordable generation. So it's endemic to uh, a lack of regulation, which was also the reason why we had a financial crisis. It's, it's the same lack of um, regulation problem. Um, and it's also a problem with um, energy contracts. Thank you. OK, I'm going to comment quite quickly on what somebody put and then I'm going to come to one more question and then we're in summaries and winding up. We've had a marathon two hour and we're doing extremely well. So well done, everyone. Um, somebody mentioned the MPPS, so the National Planning Policy Framework, and it needs to be adjusted to allow onshore to move forward, which it absolutely should be. And just as a comment on the National Policy um, Planning Framework, which is actually um, guidance, it's not actually law after all anyway, is that it actually has it's, it's quite well sections to show that it's sustainable development, which is economic social development and then environmental but actually what happens in practice in many local authorities is you get 90 percent is all about economic development nine percent is social and it's one percent environment and so things aren't brought forward on renewables and all these other things and we see much too much coming through where we get plans come through where all of these houses i think as kayla said uh kayla abreu said at the beginning um, that are built and they're not fit for purpose. I think it was Kayla. Um, but actually they're not orientated. So they're not oriented to take advantage of the sunlight in the, in the winter, but are orientated to keep themselves cool in the, you know, in the, in the summer, et cetera. So abs it's absolutely failing, although right at the heart of the MPPF is a requirement that we should be mitigating and adapting to climate change. So it's extraordinary it's not done. So I do agree that we need to get governments and local authorities to, to change their attitude to it, use it in a different way, and then we need to amend it. Right, somebody's made a, a good point about the national grid. Okay, so um, if we get all of the wind we want, and Andy was talking about connections between Scotland coming down to England and what we do about it. So I'm gonna to come to Chris with this to begin with, um, and then to whoever would like to take it. And we are on about five minutes on this question, but I'm gonna give, going to give you an all a sort of, you know, 30 second, one minute sum up. So um, to get the national grid fit for purpose, Chris, if we're gonna have all of our electricity generation by 2030 by renewables, okay, there'll be storage involved, what do we have to do to get the national grid fit for purpose? What well, can we do it? Is, is well, that can we do it? And if we can do it, what do we have to do for the national grid to be fit for purpose for 2030? Um, it may need to be completely reconstructed at some point, and I don't believe we can do that by uh, 2030. Um, because it, it's a bit of a sort of um, spaghetti program. In fact, it's very old as the national grid and it's been patched up for different um, purposes over time. So I, th 
I think it it could probably carry hmm, what another I've seen 15 percent capacity if we're really going to start electrifying things. But beyond that, that I think you, you're going to need to start reconstructing it. And can we do, do that by 2030? Hmm, that depends on it on exactly how much power it's got to carry. Um, maybe part of that is actually, and we've sort of alluded to this quite a few times already today, is completely changing the way we look at energy. So we have local production and local provision. So you've got your local energy networks, which presumably, and I'm not an expert, so this is trading over to all you experts. Um, if you're going to create a local network, presumably your local network could be standing beside the grid. It wouldn't have to be involved in being in the national grid. Is that right? Depending on exactly what device pieces you were using yes it, you, you could work it like that yeah yeah true so and maybe that becomes more possible yes to develop a sort of um small scale uh, or smaller scale parallel uh, infrastructure if you like that works on a sort of uh, community by community basis or home by home uh, basis yeah, yeah. My, micro grids yeah so th i think there are and, and again maybe um one of the kaylas knows better than I but I know microgrids as a concept is certainly a thing which is exactly mm. ex exactly that M my noddy understanding is that there's usually still a connection to the national to, to the main grid though just to be able to plug in when, when there's uh, when there's peaks and troughs but again I think it's technically feasible and I keep saying that broken mm. record here but uh... Uh, either of the Kaylas like to come in on this one so on microgrids go, go on and Kayla Abreu yeah it can be done there are several um, places where communities are run in island mode, so they are self-sufficient on their own, especially communities that are far away from the, the main grid, uh, not just in the UK, but in other countries. Yes, it can be done. You will need, you might need a small import capacity to run some of the, the components of the power generation site. So, you know, the transformer or whatever, you might need a little bit, but it's not the same as uh, servicing the community. You can have a small input connection to the grid and still generate power and distribute it to the end user within an island system. It can be done. And it, 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 I, I believe that it would be the solution to some of the um, energy issues we have at the moment. Okay, Lorenzo, just topping off on this, Thinking of some of the projects you've looked at, have you done anything like this or looked at anything like that for the future? Well, it, what Kayla says absolutely makes sense. Uh, some of the villages that we've been working in, their their networks are so old that they, they, they barely are fit for purpose. There's constant power outages. And so just replacing that grid uh, in a village would make a lot of sense uh, and, and upgrading that. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to start calling it to an end now, but you're not let off the hook, uh, all four of you. It's that it's that moment about the, the silver bullet to solve everything. So so getting your, your thinking caps on and it, it's a 30 seconder on from your point of view. What is the silver bullet we need to give ourselves energy security in the UK? Decarbonized energy security in the UK by 2030, and you've got 30 seconds each. Chris, you've unmuted, so we'll let you go first. For me? So you, you've gone silent. Sorry, yes, Chris, you go ahead first. Oh, okay. Um, well, here's a, an interesting and potentially useful a statistic. This came from uh, Fetty Birrell, who's the head of the IEA. He said if everybody turned their thermostats down by, from 21 degrees to 19 degrees, there'd be no need uh, um, for the output from the, the Nord 1 um, gas pipeline from Russia. So we could uh, cut our energy use in homes probably by 15%. Uh, by turning down the thermostat. So there, there's a practical thing. And uh, I also heard that if everybody in Europe um, drove cars to the extent um, of the average person in Hungary, there'd be no need for Europe to import oil from Russia. So I thought those are interesting and potentially useful. So, so actually, Chris, your silver bullet is reduction. Yep. Conscious reduction, but not actually by very much. Still, ha still having you know, quite a normal standard of living. Yes. Right, brilliant. Okay, we'll go to Kayla Abreu, please. 
my solution would be build more renewables localized everywhere. Mm -hmm. Ins start insulating the homes and cut down your energy consumption. Great. Uh, going to Kayla Enter, please. I agree with everything that's been said, and I would lower the train fares to make them more affordable so people take more trains instead of driving and increase uh, the amount of electric uh, vehicle charging points and subsidize um, the cost of electric vehicles. Terrific. And Andy, it's always easier when you go last and you've already had all the 15 good ideas have been all the above. Yeah, um, three things briefly, all of the above, everything every, everybody said. Um, when Hope Energy is obviously a supplier, you obviously get your energy from Hope Energy. Um, the other thing is uh, people like the people on the panel need to be running the show. So we need people who understand this stuff and really get it to be in charge. Uh, because until we get that leadership point in place, it's all well and good us having these lovely debates and in somewhat echo chambers, nothing will change. So, yeah, we need the right people in power. Yeah, I mean, absolutely right. And as we as we thank all of our speakers now, but in, in, in drawing it to a close. So thank you, um, Kayla, Kayla, Chris and Andy. Um, but Andy finishes on a note which is very sort of close to the heart of Scientists Warning Europe was in the last paper, which is leadership. Um, and it, you're absolutely right. We've got all these fantastic ideas. And as some people have said, the finance exists in this country. The technology exists. We need to get the right focus and then we need to get the leadership. Now, I know we're all focused on national leadership to some extent when we have these debates, but it goes right through the communities. So there are many, many people here who are at different levels of leadership, be it to be good examples for their neighbours and or leadership in their businesses, within their communities, within their parishes, etc., um, or if it is leadership in contacting local councillors and MPs and driving them forward, um, or if it's in leadership in going out to vote for the right people when the next election comes around. So leadership starts at home, everybody, and we've all got to show it. Um, and then we've got to demand of our leaders higher up the chain. So like our new um, candidates who are soon to be one and we seem to be PM is demand they give us the right climate leadership on this. And that's on all of our shoulders. And um, as one of the ladies said in the film, one of the scientists, is it's not just on my shoulder or your shoulders, it's on all of us, but we've all got to step up to the plate and do it. So absolutely right. Leadership is probably the most important thing in all of this. So thank you very, very much to everybody for coming. Um, that's absolutely wonderful. Some fantastic solutions and things. And in fact, I'm going to be pretty much on the phone to all four of you asking for different tips now on different things that have come up during this. So that's absolutely great. Thank you very much for everyone who's joined us. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. We will continue to do these now. So please make sure that you are registered or follow us on one of our social media or through Eventbrite or something else so that when we have these next events and they're in our sort of on the way to COP27, we're going to bring out other things now over the next weeks and months. Please come and join us for them. And when you do join, send in questions and things to us. And if we can, we'll get to them. We did get something like two or three hundred chat messages during this one. So I hope we covered quite a few of the themes um, actually that came up through those. I'm sorry we couldn't have covered it all. So thank you ever so much, everybody. Thank you again to the speakers. All the best. Bye-bye.